Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at Nassau Community College, along with Nassau Community College student, Gina Peter. And today we're going to learn about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis inflammatory bowel disease. Our guest today is Susan Gomberg, the Director of Fundraising Campaigns and Volunteer Engagement at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Long Island. Susan, welcome to Your Family's Health on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Welcome. Hi, ladies, and thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and letting people know about inflammatory bowel disease. So I hope you're doing well in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. How has this virus affected you personally? Well, it really hasn't affected me personally in very profound ways. My I and uh, no one in my family has come down with COVID-19. Um, so we're very fortunate and grateful for that. We've also been working from home. My daughter is in law school and she's been attending virtual classes and I've been working from my living room. So for those that don't know, what are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis inflammatory bowel disease? So Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are two diseases that collectively are known as inflammatory bowel disease. They are chronic, painful, and unpredictable digestive diseases that affect the um, digestive system anywhere from the mouth to the anus. Crohn's disease tends to be um, kind of focused in the upper part of the GI tract through the terminal ileum and the beginning of the colon and colitis is restricted to the colon. They are, um, they are characterized by uh, inflammation in the tract that are known as ulcerations or granulomas. Uh, They can cause uh, a, inability to thrive, weight loss, diarrhea, uh, obviously pain, um, and a host of extra intestinal manifestations. So um, describe for me who is at risk for these inflammatory bowel um, diseases? So the risk factors um, for developing either of these conditions um, focus on three things. In every case, there is a genetic component. There are over 200 genes that have been implicated in either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Uh, The microbiome, which are the little bacteria that populate your gut, and an environmental factor such as diet or having a virus or going on an antibiotic or even stress Um, And the environmental factors are the ones that are right now most mysterious in terms of actually provoking the incidence of the disease. What are some symptoms of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis inflammatory bowel disease? So most commonly they present first with um, gut pain, diarrhea or diarrhea alternating with constipation, um, weight loss um, in children and inability to grow or gain weight uh, is most common, but they can also, believe it or not, present with symptoms that have nothing to do with the gut or digestion, especially in children. Often children are diagnosed because they have joint pain, the extra intestinal manifestations, uh, particularly joint ones, um, but sometimes skin, sometimes eyes um, can provoke a diagnosis of either Crohn's or colitis And often it's done in a rheumatologist's office where they'll say, you don't have rheumatoid arthritis, you need to see a gastroenterologist, we think you have Crohn's disease. 
So um, how early um, can this, uh, these diseases be diagnosed in terms of age? How so early? They- so the earliest patients I know of um, is was diagnosed at about two weeks. Um, so they do believe that that infants can actually develop it in utero, um, which is which is somewhat strange because the um, components, the microbiome, the bacteria in your gut when you are in utero is very neutral. Um, and so it's unusual, but we do have patients who have been diagnosed as early as uh, two weeks. Uh, many patients are diagnosed in childhood. The most common diagnoses take place between the ages of 18 and 35. Um, and recently, there's been an increase in new diagnoses among the elderly, 65 and over. What, uh, what medications and treatments are available? So I'll just get ulcerative colitis out of the way. Um, Ulcerative colitis can potentially be cured by the total surgical removal of the colon. um, And that is an extreme treatment, but and considered a cure. In terms of the medications for Crohn's and colitis, there's a whole host of medications that anyone who watches television probably feels if they see another ad for a Crohn's or colitis disease medication, they're going to turn off their TV. There's so much money and profit to be made in these medications. Um, So there are three classes of medications. The original um, medication were in a class called ASA medications. ASA stands for amino salicylates, which is an actually an aspirin compound and functions as an anti-inflammatory the same way aspirin does if you hurt your ankle. Um, and there's a whole host of oral medications in that in that um, in that class of medications. Um, the next group of Medications are considered immunosuppressants, um, of which corticosteroids would be, prednisone would be um, like the most common one going on to uh, medications that are in the thiopurine family. So it's imuran, azathioprine, uh, 6-MP6, mecaptopurine. And then the final group of medications are known as biologics, and those are the ones you see the television ads for, Remicade, Humira, Stellara. They are the most, they are considered the gold standard of treatment today. Most of those are delivered through either injection or infusion, um, and they are very, very effective medications. So this medication combination um, that you just described um, how effective are those medications in managing um, the patient that uh, is symptomatic? Um, is, and it, are there exacerbations um, and remissions with, this, with these diseases? So, uh, so these diseases are characterized by what we call remissions and flares. Um, and the goal of treatment is now something called total mucosal healing, which means that the lining of your digestive tract shows no sign of inflammation either by visual inspection, which would be done through uh, a colonoscopy, an endoscopy, or even there's a capsule that you can swallow that takes 10,000 images from your mouth to your anus and um, doesn't do anything in terms of a um, pathology. They're not taking any samples. So, uh, so on visual inspection, there would be no signs of inflammation. Your gut would look healthy or on, um, taking um, biopsies through, let's say a colonoscopy or an endoscopy, there would be no microscopic indication of inflammation either. Um, the medications have gotten better over the years. The understanding of what medication, would be right for a patient is something that's being heavily researched at this time. So we're all entering an era of individualized medicine. You hear a lot about it in cancer treatment, 
you hear a lot about it in all autoimmune conditions of which uh, these diseases fall into the category of autoimmune. So, so much money and effort is being put into research into what biomarkers, what indications are there in your blood, in your genes, in your microbiome that would tell a physician exactly what medication is going to work for an individual patient? So it's much less of a shotgun approach now and much more of a pointed approach. And that is only going to be getting better and better as time goes on. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard, along with NASA Community College student Gina Peter. And today we're learning about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis inflammatory bowel disease. Our guest, Susan Gumberg, the Director of Fundraising Campaigns and Volunteer Engagement at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Long Island. So um, just to pick up from where we left off, how is this uh, disease or diseases diagnosed? You talked about the swallowed capsule and you talked about ostomies. What are some of the other diagnostics that are used to diagnose these? So most patients are diagnosed with a combination of blood work and colonoscopy and endoscopy. Um, an ostomy is um, a sur- an outcome of surgery that wouldn't be a diagnostic technique. Um, so usually what will happen is a patient will present with symptoms. They will be referred to a gastroenterologist. The gastroenterologist will do blood work looking for markers of inflammation in the blood, which can be a sedimentation rate, a C-reactive protein, a measure of eosinophils. They might do a stool test, but ultimately it's through biopsies taken in a colonoscopy and endoscopy setting that would confirm a diagnosis. So how does this differ from irritable bowel syndrome? So that's a great question, and that's probably one of the most confusing um, issues in the general public's mind about um, Crohn's and colitis or inflammatory bowel disease. Most people think it's the same thing or very, very similar, and they're very, very different. So Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are actually diseases, and they are characterized by cellular changes in the lining of the gut. Um, And those are measurable changes that are seen in, as I said, blood and biopsy. Irritable bowel syndrome is actually a condition or syndrome, and it is really a mechanical uh, it's a mechanical misfunction of your of your gut. So it has more to do with how food goes through your gut. It has to do with the peristalsis. It has to do with um, how quickly from the time you eat something till the time you um, excrete it, but it does not, it's not characterized by any cellular changes. Now, many patients have both. Um, many inflammatory bowel disease patients also have um, irritable bowel syndrome. Some have celiac or gluten intolerance as well. Many have a lactose intolerance, but all of those are not diseases. They are all conditions. What lifestyle changes uh, can one make uh, once diagnosed with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis that would help to manage the symptoms of these diseases? Well, that's also a new area of research. I think for many, many years, um, the advice given to patients is just go about your life, do what you can, don't do what you can, eat what you can, don't eat what you can't. Um, If you don't feel well, stay home. And now I think there's been a tremendous amount of research done into mindfulness, into meditation, into exercise, um, into many lifestyle changes that will reduce stress, which is definitely an exacerbating factor for anyone who doesn't feel well, whether it's a chronic illness like Crohn's or colitis or any you know, chronic illness like diabetes or, or multiple sclerosis or anything, stress makes you feel worse. So all stress reducing techniques that have come into much more common usage are all helpful. Um, and 
watching your diet, keeping a food diary, don't stopping to eat from foods that seem to make you feel sick, being aware of what makes you feel better and what makes you feel worse, I think are the main lifestyle changes. Um, are these diseases uh, something where if you catch it early on, you can prevent it? And is it fatal? How serious can it get? So um, it's a little unclear. And again, it's an area of new research as to whether or not there's some intervention that can be done to change the course of the disease early on. Um particularly in familial situations where there's a strong family history of inflammatory bowel disease from multiple members of a family, which would indicate a strong genetic or microbial um, inclination towards developing the disease. A lot of research is, is going on into how to manipulate the content of the microbes in your gut that would potentially create a healthier environment where the disease, if the genetic component is there and an environmental factor were to be brought in, the disease, the microbes in your gut would be healthy enough to prevent that disease from kind of taking hold, so to speak. It's really a very new area of research. And I personally don't know a single person who could successfully say, oh, I was about to get Crohn's disease, but I avoided it. You know, it's it's definitely something that the scientists are starting to look into. Um, in terms of it being a fatal disease, it is not a fatal disease. People live with it. They die with it. They don't die from it. So you can have complications of the disease, you know, surgical complications that could cause someone to potentially, you know, die, but it wouldn't be dying from the disease. They die with the disease. So talk to me about, you mentioned surgeries. Um, um, are there surgeries that would, uh, you, you mentioned colon resections. How about colostomies, um, ileostomies, all those kinds of diversional fecal um, appliances, ostomies that would, I guess, could be possible. Is this possible? Is this common with these diseases? So surgery is now considered um kind of along the compendium of treatment options, you know, um, I think it's something like 70% of Crohn's patients experience at least one surgery in their lifetime. And the number is much smaller for colitis patients. Um, and I can explain why. Um, so in Crohn's, you can have many different kinds of surgeries. You the, Probably the, the most common ones are resections or stricture plasties, which are similar. Um, they A resection is where a surgeon will go in and now most often laparoscopically. Um, so it doesn't need, you know, don't need to have um, your whole uh, torso cut open. Um, laparoscopically and either cut out a small section or even multiple sections of, of diseased gut or uh, creating a stricture plasty is where there's a narrowing of the gut due to scar tissue and disease activity where they kind of widen that area. There are several surgical techniques for doing that. Um, and patients commonly will have that kind of surgery. Um, if your Crohn's disease infiltrates as far as your colon um, or you have colitis, um, you can have your entire colon removed. And that is when you would uh, be looking at either a temporary ostomy or a permanent ostomy. And an ostomy is a um, diversion of the gut from the inside of your body where it would um, excrete fecal material through your rectum and anus to a, um, a what's called a stoma, which is actually taking the taking the um, intestine and creating a hole in your torso somewhere, and having the intestine come out a little bit through that hole 
and you would wear an appliance, uh, usually some form of a bag that would capture the fecal material. Um, in today's world, most people are having temporary ostomies so that they can kind of take the pressure off their lower um, intestines and have some time to heal. And then there is um, a procedure um, called a J pouch operation where the part of the healthy part of the intestine is reconnected to the rectum and excretion happens in a normal fashion, but the small intestine takes over some of the function of a colon and it's actually shaped like a J. So at the bottom is where the stool would collect and then come out in its normal fashion. Um, and then there are people who, who either have to have permanent ostomies or actually choose to have permanent ostomies often for a quality of life because then they live basically pain free and disease free for the rest of their life. Talk to me about this psychosocial cultural um, implications that this disease comes, it comes, it comes with it with regard to um, the, you talked about a very young population. How uh, does this, uh, these diseases impact uh, patients socially? Well, that's also a great question and an area that a lot of research is now being focused on um, because in the past, I think people, you know, children in general were never really treated as almost a separate patient population with separate needs and separate psychosocial issues. Obviously, if there are, um, if obviously anyone living in pain um, has, issues, particularly for children where there's delayed growth and delayed puberty, um, they experience some, they can experience some alienation, um, they miss days of school so that they are, you know, potentially less integrated into a social, you know, a social swing of things, so to speak. Um, and it, and that holds true for adults as well. I mean, one of the hardest things about this disease is are that they're unpredictable. So they hold plans, they hold weddings, they hold graduations, they make people take time off of school or time off of work. Um, they they impact the entire family psychosocially. They, you know, I, I'll, I remember when um, a patient, a, a family member who had a young patient um, was at a, was in a parent support group. We have support groups for parents, for um, teenagers, for patients, for spouses. Um, and they reported that their, their, their not chick, sick child came home one day and said, what does somebody have to do to get some attention around here? Do you have to have a stomach ache? You know, so it does really affect the entire family um, in, in so many ways. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Kokorard, along with NASA Community College student Gina Peter. And today we're learning all about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, inflammatory bowel disease. With our guest, Susan Gomberg, the Director of Fundraising Campaigns and Volunteer Engagement at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Long Island. Um, Susan, can you tell me how the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is working to support patients while funding research? So uh, we have a dual mission of improving the lives of children and adults suffering from these diseases, as well as funding both clinical and basic science research for a cure. Um, we have we were founded in 1967, actually, by a Long Island family, um, along with another New York City family and their doctor. Um, and we hold education programs, both for patients and for medical professionals. We hold support groups locally, as well as online support groups, as well as one-on-one -on -one support for patients all through connecting with a local chapter, in which case we are a Long Island chapter, but we have 40 chapters nationwide, or through our national 
helpline, which is one eight 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 my gut pain, um, or our our chap our foundation website, which is www Crohn's Colitis Foundation dot org, um, where we can uh, connect you with a patient who has similar conditions to you or with an online right now, all of our support groups are meeting online because of the pandemic, but we do hope to go back to in-person support groups as well as online support groups. How can people get involved? Well, we have many programs, both national programs and local programs where people can get involved. We have a national walk called the take steps walk. We have a national um, spin for Cu- Crohn's and colitis cures program. And we have a national endurance program where people do races of various lengths, including ultra marathons to raise money and awareness um, for the foundation and all of which can be found on the website. We also do local events such as galas and luncheons um, and we have many volunteer opportunities for people who are interested in um, either earning, like for students who are interested in earning community credits for um, uh, fraternities and sororities. Um, when we are back again after the pandemic, we have lots of in-person volunteer opportunities. We can train people to become support group leaders. There are many, many ways to get involved. The best uh, thing to do is to reach out through our uh, website and to make a connection with a staff person or another volunteer. What is the one thing you want to leave our audience with when it comes to Crohn's and colitis? I think the one thing that I would, what I try haven't mentioned yet is that there are 3.1 million Crohn's and colitis patients in this country. That is approximately one in a hundred in the Northeast that that where there is a concentration of patients that probably is more like one in 50. Everybody knows somebody. Everybody has classmates, workmates, uh, members of their houses of worship. It is This disease is not a disease that can stay in the closet anymore. It is really common. It is almost epidemic. And the best thing to do is to get involved, if you know somebody, to get involved with the foundation because we will find a cure. So thank you for being here, Susan Gomberg, the Director of Fundraising Campaigns and Volunteer Engagement at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Long Island. We hope you stay safe and continue to do great work. And thank you for being our guest today. This is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College, along with student Gina Peter. And we want to thank you for listening to this week's edition of Your Family's Health. We'd like to get your feedback on your family's health. Send your comments by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu. Podcasts of today's show are available on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. This program was produced at the studios of Nassau Community College in cooperation with the nursing department. Join us next week for another edition of Your Family's Health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.